founded it, Walford Hall Modern and Morris 30 plus years ago. The four of us were at different universities for our degrees. Paul and I, who each run a design studio at Sheffield, and Jonathan and Peter at Bristol, and we all went to the Bartlett. So we set our own project called The Fifth Man, which is a project about collaboration, but collaboration without compromise. My name is Simon Orford. I'm co-founder of Orford Hall Modern & Morris Architects, and this is the Architect Series. We were steeped in the history of modern architecture. My own father was a modern architect who was connected with Breuer and Alto and people through his partners. So we were steeped in modern architecture. We were steeped in London. We were steeped in the city. And we talked about the importance of the everyday and architecture as a social project, regardless of your client, whether your client is private or public. Architecture is for the long term. Hi, I'm, I'm Paul Monaghan. I'm one of the founding directors of Alfred Hall Monaghan Morris. I think the idea of creating the studio was quite impulsive, quite quick. We'd done quite well in a competition in a city called Birmingham in, in the middle of England. And we hadn't quite won, but we came second in a few of the sites. And we thought maybe this is easy. And then we were 27 then, so quite young. And I'd say in hindsight, very naive. Um, because we didn't get jobs easily for a long, long time. But yeah, it was really just impulsive. And uh, it was a really exciting period. AHMM today is a very large practice with a footprint in London, global projects but steeped in London. I think that's our craft and our training ground and we import and export ideas from around the world. If I think about what Alfred Hall Monaghan Morris is now, I think, in a way, it's just an enlarged version of what the four of us were. So it's full of you know, fantastically talented people who work in a really collaborative way, who have a great ambition for architecture and ambition to enjoy working in architecture. I'm Suthi Lagood. Um, I'm director for in Paul Studio, and I have been here for probably about 30 years, which seems a very, very long time. And so I have seen the practice grow from, there were six of us, so the four founding partners. When there were six of us, we were in a much smaller office, actually, ironically, in the West End. So higher rents, and for a fledgling practice, maybe not the best, but anyway, that's where we started. And then we moved into this series of buildings. And then finally in London, we took some space in the White Collar Factory, which is also one of our buildings. And then I would say in terms of the other sort of practice locations, there's obviously Bristol and Oklahoma, and those probably started around sort of 12, 15 years ago. And then more recently, we've got a sort of fledgling office in Madrid and a very fledgling office in, um, with one person at the moment, one director went to Australia. So all quite exciting. I'm Morag Tate. I've been working at AHMM since uh, 1999. For us, um, research is important because it's a sort of integral part of our design process. We design in a very iterative way and we analyse lots of the external factors and that then informs our design strategy. So a lot of the research is really embedded within the project teams and the form that then takes for us is that we then try and extract that from the project teams so that we make it available to the rest of the practice. The other thing which is very important at the moment is the whole approach to sustainability, you know, in the wider context of sort of climate and how we seriously address that because obviously as architects I think we've got quite a 
big part to play in terms of sort of you know addressing some of these you know really significant issues. I suppose sustainability has been um, on our minds since we set up. We were very lucky to grow up with some of the best environmental engineers in, in London who then became well known around the world. And so it was always on our minds with buildings and slowly became a much more important part of the building. I think now it's so vital, it comes hand in hand with starting a project. As you probably know, the regulations in England are very stringent now. So it's almost something that you consider literally on day one. We've been conscious of the environmental agenda since we were students. Uh, for us, that doesn't transcend architecture. It informs architecture. So Charles and Ray Eames said, without constraint, there is no design. We are interested in that challenge. And in many ways, we think it can help define the future of architecture. I'm Dr. Craig Robertson. I'm head of sustainability at AHMM. I've worked uh, in the practice for nine years, I think, nine and a half years. We work as an internal consultancy and we interrogate and support our architectural decisions to make sure we're making the best possible decisions about carbon and uh, environmental performance, energy use intensity, comfort, uh, the human experience of reusing our buildings, biodiversity, and all, all the kind of the aspects that architecture can influence. I suppose my favourite tactics for sustainability are um, light, big windows, so light and harnessing the sun, ventilation, buildings that feel fresh, buildings that you can control without lots of digital systems, so that you know you open a window or you turn something on, and I think um, those are the best systems. My job title is Head of Sustainability, but we call our internal sustainability team the Building Performance Team. interested in the metrics of our architecture that we can measure and analyze and model uh, and we model them parametrically so that we can test a developing design really quickly with our architectural teams as part of that iterative design process and its performance parameters so it might be solar gains on a facade or it might be comfort within the space or energy use intensity of a volume but the kind of the passive aspects of architecture and how they influence performance. So we think sustainability for us is about the performance of buildings and how well they achieve their aims. Soho Place um, is what I call slow architecture. So we started the project in 2005 and we finished it in 2022. I was continuously on it, amongst other things, and so are some other members of the team. But essentially, it's the architecture of infrastructure. It exists because London created a thing called Crossrail because Crossrail basically removed large amounts of the ground. It wasn't just trains. It was, you know, trains connected to other trains. You basically created these voids, these missing teeth in important parts of London. Tottenham Court Road was a major station. So we worked for three years master planning the Crossrail site with our client and Crossrail to show how we could bring work, housing, and culture onto the site once the station was finished. We then worked for five or six years with the station designers to make sure that the iceberg that they built below ground would actually engage with the building that we hadn't designed, but we might want to design to sit above. It wasn't certain this would happen, so it was about contingency and kind of tolerance in an idea of structure. Both buildings sit on mass dampers separate to the infrastructure below. The theatre 
sits on a mass damper. It has an auditorium that sits on a, on a separate structure within it. It has a rehearsal hall that sits on a separate structure. It has a club above and then it has some offices above. So it's the most complex city sandwich. It's fantastically absurd that we've built it, but it's great for London that it exists. And you get this very nice relationship of office, as I call it, the urban palazzo, the, the place of work. You have culture, the cinema, which is also a public room at ground floor. We make a new public square between the two, a little pocket square. And we also connect with the historical, the oldest civic building in the area, which is uh, St. Patrick's Church. So you get this new relationship set up. In many ways, like with Amsterdam, it's this idea of city making, using buildings to both repair the city, but also to reinvent the city, to suggest a more generous, accommodating, open future. Burnwood School is uh, an all-girls school in South London, Wandsworth. It's for 2,000 students, so it's a huge school, really big. It's a secondary school, so the children are from 11 to 18. And our job was to extend the school and rebuild some of the buildings that had fallen apart. Wood School is a completely different kind of building. It's a, it's a campus. Um, it was a complex build process because it had to maintain operation as a school during the construction. So it says a number of pavilions in a green space. It meant we located some of the buildings in places where there was no building. So we build a building and then knock a building down and then we build another building in a bit of grass in a field and effectively that allowed us to build it in, over a period of five years. But then compositionally, in plan, we looked at IIT um, in Chicago, it's plan that Mies van der Rohe did, where it has these sliding volumes. In a way, that's how the composition of the site plan came. The manufacturer of that building is precast concrete panels, which gave us greater air tightness, theoretically greater air tightness, and it gave us better thermal performance on those buildings. But I, the reason I wanted to talk about that one is because we spent four years working with UCL, doing a, an extensive post occupancy evaluation of that building, so drilling down into the energy use demand for the building, understanding how people are using it, how they like the building, and understanding it's not working as where we might have expected. And through that process, we learned a, a massive amount about energy consumption, about how spaces are used, and the assumptions about the design process, and how that can sometimes conflict with what actually happens in the building. Lansdowne House is in many ways the kind of ultimate London project. You have the oldest uh, square in London, Berkeley Square. You have a series of magnificent historical buildings and then a whole zoo of the history of architecture. But there was, it used to go all the way through to Piccadilly, the garden, and there was one site that was never built on till the 1930s. So it's almost virgin land, which is unusual. And then we inherited the site on its, the second building had been built 40 years ago. And it was a building that was very much about a use work. There was no sense of generosity, no sense of space, and no sense of theater to allow people to play and adapt the building. So after two years of review, um, we, took, we decided to take the building down. Um, and build a new urban palazzo that related to the history of this site, which has always been 
rather grand, large-scale buildings. It's also quite rare in central London because it has all four elevations onto streets. It has no, no back, it has four fronts, but the primary one is on the square. And again, we tried to learn from the history of our practice and the history of this site, and that was of the rigidity and failure of the previous buildings. What we decided was, let's make the building a very generous volume. Because we knew the stairs and the lifts are actually changing in the way we think about buildings, and because the building we were taking down had five cores, which made it useless, we thought, well, actually, we will make our core, which normally gives us stiffness, we will make that soft out of removable components, and that will mean our building becomes stiff, and therefore our frame goes from this size to this size. We go all the way around the history of modern architecture, back to the idea, that actually the wall is a window on a heroic scale. And so that became the kind of competition-winning idea for the project. So it was trying to solve the problem of freedom and create constraint that then gives us architecture. But of course the windows are five and a half metres by nine metres. The volumes span 12 metres. So it's the biggest and most generous shed we've ever made in the, probably the most important site in which we'll ever build in London, Berkeley Square. But in a sense, it represents a kind of journey that we've been on. So Tower Hamlets is in East London. It's um, near an area called Whitechapel. Tower Hamlets Town Hall is where that local government, Tower Hamlets, operates. Um, so it's a very big building. But the most interesting thing is they bought an old hospital and the hospital is where the building is now. They bought the hospital, which is, some of it is over 200 years old, so some of it's 18th century. It was built mostly in the 19th century and it was adapted all the time. It had a huge maternity, so loads of people were born there in that area, so loads of people know the building. And we won the competition to design it and we kept most of the old building and then built a new building around the back. Inside the new building, you can see the old building, but that back elevation of the old building is now inside. What's fantastic is this grain of new versus this fantastic brickwork that's 200 years old in front of you, so it has this fantastic feel. The University of Amsterdam was the reuse uh, and reconfiguration of a 1960s um, campus building in Amsterdam. It's an international competition. We won it in the early 2000s. And there was a classic urban project. It was an incomplete 1960s master plan, a million square foot of development, listed, but that sat as a sort of wonderfully foreign imposition into the historic fabric of Amsterdam. And our ambition for that project was always that we will keep the building. We don't have to make our architecture, we will find architecture from it. The big idea was the building cuts across the canal and it cuts off the buildings behind and the journey to the zoo and it creates a barrier between the town and the university. So our, the idea we then constructed was actually to remove architecture, to cut a very large hole in the building, 
to allow the city to come through to open a window to the world beyond. To release the canal, to remake the riverside, to retain all the stairs and lifts that were there but there weren't enough, and then to make a building where 25,000 students who were working at home would start to come and stay. And so it was about creating lecture halls, seminar rooms, there's two and a half thousand places in lecture halls and seminar rooms, to create a journey in the city, to connect the city with the university, and then to connect the students with the building and to make them stay is about an architectural promenade. And a building that you understand and a building you can see has been remade that has an identity that isn't new, but it is, it is building upon its 1960s and 1980s heritage. And the city architect, Norbert Gavronsky, who was alive, I used to meet him when we were cutting his history up. He sent me a lovely postcard at the end of the project which just said, you know, my baby has become your grown up. And by our project, it's his project, it's our project, it's the city's project. So that's, that to me is the essence of good long-term design and good long-term design is sustainable. There are lots of simple, clever things, so we liken that. We expose all the structure, we minimize the servicing, we create facades that are informed by Amsterdam. So we reused that building, we retained some of the 80% of the frame. The original building was conceived at a time when Amsterdam was a car-based place and it separated our pedestrians from traffic. So so we can re knitted that building into the community. From a social sustainability point of view, that building knits itself back into the fabric. It opens up the views along the canal really well. But then from a kind of technical point of view, because we reused so much of the frame, we just embody carbon in that building by massive amounts by keeping the existing frame. We also, in the insertions that we did make in the building, for example, the bridge over the, the canal, which contains this amazing student space, the concrete that makes up that beam is 80% GGBS, so we minimised the amount of cement in that building. In the new parts of the building that we had to make, minimise the embodied carbon in there. So that building does lots of things sustainably that aren't necessarily massively visible, but it's, it's doing a lot of good things. And that's the important thing to me and us. A good architecture is not a piece that's perfect when the architect leaves it. It's a piece that is better 10 years afterwards. Scotland Yard was a huge um, win for our practice and um, obviously it's one of the most famous buildings in the world. You could go anywhere in the world and people know what Scotland Yard is. So it was a real honour to be involved with that and to work with the head of the Metropolitan Police. And design a building, they wanted to be transparent in the way that they didn't want it to be intimidating for people who came. The Metropolitan Police have had issues over the last 20 years and they wanted to make sure that this building was showed a transparency to the country or to London which they look after. So our idea was number one to keep the older building so we'd worked really hard with this lovely older building and put a new glass pavilion in front with curved ends which is right on the embankment, right by the River Thames, right next to the Houses of Parliament. So it's a prime site. And this glass drum is where you go in, and so it feels very friendly. Everyone can see what's going on. And it, it's a great way of entering the building. The key sustainable element to this building was actually keeping the old building and reusing it, rather than knocking it down and that was a key part of it. And because the building was the very original Scotland Yard from 120 years ago, then they moved out. They went back to their old home, so it was quite interesting.
We've been very lucky and we've met so many interesting people along the way. And no day is the same in a way, it's always different. So yeah, I think if, if you really have a passion, you're good at art, go for it and um, you'll achieve your dreams, I'm sure. I always say architecture is a wonderful career, but you don't have to be an architect. So first of all, it's a great subject to study. And as you know, in Italy, architects can go off and do all kinds of things. Um, make a choice to be an architect. And then always, I think, use the history of architecture to project you into the future. And remember, it's a long game. I've always loved doing architecture. I loved it from when I first went to university and I've never lost that passion for it. And I believe if you have a passion for it, you will enjoy your career. People say, oh, oh they're obsessed with architecture. My family would say, I'm obsessed with architecture. The obsession isn't always a good thing. Actually, life teaches you more about architecture than anything else. So just observing life informs you hugely and recognizing that we are just the backdrop to that life. We might be the most wonderful backdrop, but we are the backdrop to life. And if your building should always thought that it's not today, it's tomorrow. How does it look tomorrow? How's it weathering? How's it aging? Is it you know, gracefully aging? Is it allowing people to change it? If someone wants to cut and adapt a building, that isn't a bad thing, it's a good thing, because it has enough qualities for them to want to retain it and play with it. It's also got to be an enjoyable journey. You've got to enjoy the journey as you go.